Well, thanks guys for joining me again. <laughs> Hopefully you don't get too sick of my voice by the end of this talk. Um, but um, we kind of split up and just thought for the Kids Get Scleroderma 2, it'd be good to focus on um, some common complication or general health guidelines. Um, this is the general, this is the juvenile systemic sclerosis um, breakout session. Um, I actually was gonna go over three different things, but in 20 minutes, we won't have too much time. So I just decided to focus on vascular. Um, so this is really cool. When you get a chance, go to the Scleroderma Foundation website um, in the patient education. They have this cool um, body diagram where you can kind of hover over um, the different like overall body component and learn a little bit more. So I stole this, this is a clip from, from the website. So a little shout out there. Um, and this is the vascular. So they have a little um, video clip um, of one of these speak adult speakers at the conference about vascular and some things there. But I wanted to give you guys some info about kids. But I was gonna do vascular, GI and musculoskeletal, but there's no way I was doing that in 20 minutes. So we're just gonna talk about vascular because baby, it's cold outside. It's fall, finally getting, you know, pumpkin carving. I'm doing that later tonight with my kids. Um, so, and then, you know, starting to get a little bit of snow soon and playing outside wearing layers. Um, but it's like a catch 22 for scleroderma patients, right? It looks beautiful, but the weather change, that's when the rain nods really flares. Um, the spring and fall actually is a little bit harder sometimes than the deep winter because of that transition of temperatures. Um, I have rain nods myself, so I know that. Um, and then also, you know, the kids that have the systemic sclerosis going out to play in the snow is not so easy, right? You, you got to wear get, uh, mittens, uh, glove warmers, things like that. So, but it's beautiful. So how do we kind of maximize things? So tis the season of the vascular problems. And that's why I decided just to focus on Raynaud's and digital ulcers. Um, I'm gonna review a patient case that has more severe Raynaud's. So um, I, I hope it doesn't scare anybody, but it's just more um, to show you all the different treatment modalities. That's the point. Cause a lot of patients I think feel like, why am I all on these medicines and what does what? So I was just trying to go through a case that has more severe involvement to show you some different things that we think about. Um, uh, so these are just pictures of, uh, by patients at different phases. This is a young girl at the very young age of two or three, um, the start of her Raynaud's. Um, this is, um, a, a preteen boy actually, but you can see the dusky fingers and the digital tip, um, ulcers that are just starting. And this is a patient, a uh, teenage female that has actually a digital ulcer there on her thumb. So we did a recent study in international cohort with Dr. Yvonne Foldeberry, which I enrolled my patients as well. Um, and 90% of the kids with juvenile onset systemic sclerosis have brain nods and 50% have digital ulcers. In the prior study, it was more of like 30%, but then now that we are prospectively looking for it, it is uh, relatively frequent. So I thought this would be a good topic to talk about. So this is a, a patient case. So uh, she was five years old um, when she came to medical attention um, and was diagnosed with uh, juvenile systemic sclerosis. Her onset was a year prior at age four, so very young, um, with Raynaud's and digital ulcers um, six months prior. So you guys can see these pictures. She has these dusky fingers that are actually a little swollen. She has a little bit of that sclerodactyly. And then these very severe um, digital ulcers on her middle and um, second finger there. Um, so this was very painful, dusky, um, and then this is actually what we call ischemia. There's like lack of blood flow to the tips of her fingers over time that she has this partial necrosis or dying of the tips of her fingers there. Um, and she also had similar changes, but less severe on her toes. Um, she had other classic signs of scleroderma, like this diffuse skin thickening, joint limitation, um, and also had some inflammation of her muscles and joints and, and weight loss. So she had GI symptoms that were just kind of more subtle. Um, but this was what we call an MRI angiogram. So it's just like an MRI, they give IV contrast, but it sees what the blood vessels look like. So a healthy hand MRA angiogram is right here in this third pane over. Um, so the big uh, radial and ulnar, ulnar arteries going to these little digital um, arteries. But you can see in this young girl, unfortunately, her um, Raynaud's and, and uh, vasculopathy or vascular problems were, were quite severe that she is very, very thin ulnar and radial arteries. And you can't even see her digital arteries. They're kind of teeny tiny. They kind of fall off there. Um, and the perfusion was so poor that you saw on her picture, she had digital ulcers, but she also had 
ischemia or, or infarct of the bone. So the bone was actually starting to die a little bit in the um, carpal, like the mid uh, wrist area and also on like the knuckle area of one of her joints. So we got to take action quickly. So this was at another hospital before she came to me, um, but was started very quickly and appropriately on a mixture of things. So prednisone, um, IVIG, that's IV immunoglobulin for her myositis part. Um, the mycophenolate mofotil or CELSEF, you guys might know that word, um, hydroxychloroquine, which is Plaquenil. So all those things are really for all her organ system inflammation and fibrosis. But then she also needs the second layer. She needs things that will help vasodilate, get those vessels open as much as possible because in a scleroderma vessel, uh, they don't just have the inflammation and fibrosis. They also have that like clamping down and narrow lumen. Lumen is the middle of the vessel. Um, so we need to dilate that lumen. The best thing uh, we usually start off with are things that are antihypertensive or blood pressure medicines that your grandma might be on, um, but it dilates the vessels. The main one is called a calcium channel blocker. Um, amlodipine is the specific name of the one that she was started on. And the one that we have been using more recently in the last 10 years, I would say or so in scleroderma are phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Um, more likely known as Viagra or Cialis on the commercials, um, you'll see that. Um, so she was starting on two vasodilators and a couple different anti-inflammation and fibrotic medications. Um, but don't forget the core measures. Um, Dr. Moore was actually just about to talk to, about this when she kind of ran out of time. Um, but wearing layers, it's not just, even if it's just the hands and feet that are really affected, actually keeping the core body temperature warm, um, it makes a huge difference. So wear lots and lots of layers um, for socks and things like that. Actually try to wear thin wool, like smart wool. Um, that's a little bit better than cotton. Con cotton, sometimes you sweat, it gets wet, and then it actually makes the, the foot or the hand cold as well. So wear lots of layers. Um, exercising is actually great. Um, it increases the circulation. It helps that those blood vessels open up a little bit more. So getting exercise as a um, part of your routine is really helpful. Um, not that this is possible all the time, but especially in the teenagers that have high school and lots of demands, like try to stay calm, find some relaxation techniques, because in addition to the cold weather inducing Raynaud's, which is that triphasic change Dr. Moore talked about, um, stress uh, can actually cause that clamping down of the blood vessels as well and make Raynaud's worse. And just be aware of the sensitivities of cold, avoid situations. A lot of the kids that they might be working at the meat market at giant eagle, they have to maybe switch to stocking shelves instead of touching the cold lunch meat, things like that. Um, just be aware, hey, I want to go to that football game at night with my friends, but I got to wear the extra layers, got to have extra hand warmers in my pockets, things like that. Gloves, gloves, and more gloves. Just have a ton of all different kinds and sizes of gloves and mittens around the house in extra pockets of coats, just so that, you know, you have backups. Um, and feet and hand warmers are awesome. Go to Costco or Sam's and buy the ginormous box. Um, you will go through it and use it. And they're very, very helpful and have them kind of in the pockets of all your different jackets and, and backpacks and things like that. Usually schools are pretty okay about the kids getting those out and just putting them in their pockets or their sweatshirt if they're, they're having um, some, some um, issues with their right nods. And really important, uh, keep the hands and feet moisturizers, moisturized and hydrated. I know my patient from Philadelphia just last week, I had to convince her over and over again to really keep, keep her hands and feet um, really moisturized. I know it's sticky sometimes, but maybe just do it at night. The Aquaphor, Vaseline, any of those thick emollients, they really get into the skin. If you keep it hydrated, that's keeping it healthy and helping prevent some of that um, cracking and then super infection. So sometimes the open cracks or ulcers can cause you can get just normal bacteria that lives on your skin can then get into the deeper layers of your skin. So you want to prevent that. Um, if you start getting the open cracking and early ulcers um, over the counter, you can order on Amazon Meta Honey. That's a great one that actually is just medical honey. It just has a little bit of natural um, antibiotic uh, to it. And it has that nice thick Vaseline. Um, but then prescription wise is Bactroban ointment that um, is an actual prescription antibiotic. So just uh, talk to your pediatric rheumatology provider about that. Um, so, you know, that was just a little break. So I just want to make sure medicines are important, but then also the protective measures are important. They're both, they go together. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more me about medications. I know that a lot of you have children on these and 
just seeing the names all at once point, I think might just be easier for people. We are not gonna you know, go into depth. There's a lot of names here. Um, but bottom line is we try to combine them. Um, if the So we usually start on that um, blood pressure medication, the calcium channel blocker I mentioned, like nifedipine, procardia, amlodipine. That's where we usually start with. But if uh, your son or daughter is not having a, a good response, we will typically start adding on therapy. Um, or if they have side effects, we would switch out and try other things. Um, side effects usually are just kind of lightheadedness, things like that, because sometimes it's having too much of an effect. It's dilating too much and it drops the blood pressure a little bit. Um, so we can kind of adjust those things. Um, but we typically do try to add on other either blood pressure medicines in the same kind of overall grouping that just have different effects of the vessel. Or as I mentioned, those phosphodiesterase inhibitor like Viagra, um, we do try to put them together. They just work slightly different on the vessel. Um, and then um, another one that we also, why these are highlighted in blue for people with more severe Raynaud's or digital ulcers like the patient I showed you, we actually typically will try to combine the three, the calcium channel blocker, the PDE5 inhibitor and endothelium receptor antagonist um, or ERAs like Bosentin. Um, those three usually we try to put together because we're affecting different parts of the vessel. Um, the endothelial or vessel lining of oh, the thing I wanted to show you was this big arrow is see how unhealthy it is. This is a normal, um, uh, a, a normal vessel will kind of clamp down, but with scleroderma, when you clamp down, you have this really thick, um, unhealthy kind of inner layer of the vessel um, that has a lot of inflammation and fibrosis. So then you really don't have that much room to move. So we want to dilate the vessel, but we also want to make the lining of that vessel healthy. So some of these agents will help to do that. And one of them is this um, bosentin or endothelial receptor antagonist. In addition, there's some protective things that we can kind of help. They don't have as much data. They're more like softer agents, we would call this, but they potentially can help get the blood flow uh, through that vessel a little bit better and also help uh, smooth out that layer in the, in, in the middle of the vessel. That would be something like low-dose aspirin, uh, pentoxifylline or trental, and a statin like a tarvostatin or cholesterol medicine. So those things are do have like small trials in adult uh, rheumatology for scleroderma. They have some benefits, but it's not huge. So that's why we don't want that just alone, but to supplement could be helpful. Another thing not to forget about, there was a trial in adult uh, systemic sclerosis patients that was positive. Um, the serotonin receptor blockers or SSSRIs, specifically fluoxetine, also known as Prozac. Um, it's for anxiety and things of that nature, but we like to use it in low dose. It does help dilate the vessel as well, especially I like this in my teenage, teenage female patients that are already having stress with high school or college. Um, it's nice to have like a little bit of anti-stress and also help your renals at the same time. Um, there's some topical agents like uh, nitrates or nitro paste that you put on the wedges in between the um, tips of the finger. So if it's like your middle finger that was affected, you put it in between the second and, uh, uh, sorry, the third and fourth and the second and third at the base to help the uh, vessel dilate. So those are more like as needed um, kind of situation. Um, last but not least are the prostanoids or the IV medicines that help really dilate the vessels, but that is an inpatient hospitalization um, because uh, there are more side effects if you're, you're getting that more aggressive therapy. So I know that was a lot, but I just wanted to put all the medicines on one page just so that you see them all on one page. And the three checks are, as I said, the patient like this that has more severe disease, typically in adult world would be recommended these three um, classes of medications. So let's go back to our patient. So now she comes to see me for the first time, but a year after being treated. Um, overall, you know, she's described as being better, but that's because her skin score went down, her, her skin's better, her joints and muscles are better. She doesn't have any inflammation in the muscles. She can move her joints much better, but she's still getting digital ulcers, like one every two to three weeks. And, you know, it's, it's quite concerning, the purple and uh, discoloration and what I would call still ongoing ischemia or lack of blood to the tips of her fingers. Um, and this is an example of those nail fold capillary changes. You might have your rheumatologist is kind of checking out um, with a microscope and her toes you can see are dusky and have like early uh, digital ulcers as well. Um, and just a reminder, she was on that calcium channel blocker and the sidenafil. Uh, those and the doses were, were kind of increased a little bit of the sidenafil at least uh, before I saw her. 
So, so I recommended a couple things. I said, let's, let's get that endothelium a little more healthy. If we can add on low dose aspirin, the statin, and then consider that pentoxifiline um, to kind of help um, just the, the softer components of the, the vessel abnormalities. And then big picture, let's try to maximize the vasodilation. Can we bump up the amlodipine dose or maybe switch her to one that's a little more long acting like nifedipine extended release? Um, and then I said, let's keep this adenophil going. Let's give some topical nitrates as needed. So you have it in your back pocket to use those if needed. Um, and then she's actually a candidate that might benefit from doing the, the scheduled um, IV prostaglandin um, at her home institution, you know, in the fall to prevent this from getting worse. Um, it's, a, it's, it's actually um, not FDA, but whatever the equivalent in Europe is approved there. So it's much easier to get in Europe than here, to be honest. Um, but in the meantime, I really wanted her to add on that um, endothelial receptor antagonist like bosentin. Um, and so though I was kind of recommending that multi-prong approach that the adult uh, systemic sclerosis folks use. Um, so those are my main recommendations. Um, I said, hey, keep in the back pocket, maybe the fluoxetine, because um, it won't lower her blood pressure. Let's maximize her, her mycophthalate mofetil or cell set. Like, don't forget that inflammatory component can also feed into the vessels too, not just the skin and muscles, et cetera. And then obviously the supportive measures we talked about, a core body warm, let's lubricate the skin, things like that. Let's be really aggressive about wound care. Um, so she follows up nine months later, a couple things were done, like increasing that calcium channel blocker and the low dose aspirin and statin. Um, and she kept going with this identophil, but there was lots of insurance and said there other issues about the bosentin and the epoprostostol that she did not get those started. But I was not happy about this giant, huge ulcer that was necrotic and how unhealthy her skin still looked. So I, I reached out to her primary institution and said, let's, let's have a team meeting. So let's get derm, plastic surgery, adult rheumatology, let's get all together. Um, so some things that are new to you guys, so the medical intervention is kind of what I was mentioning before, so that's not new. But what's new is we are also starting to think of um, some surgical interventions. And that's why I'm bringing it up in this conference in case it comes up. Um, there's digital Botox injections that you can do it to the palm or in between the digits. And dermatology actually on this call was like, we can do that next week. So that was a good option. Um, the digital sympathectomy is a little more involved. You want a hand surgeon that is very experienced. These are teeny tiny nerves that feed into the vessels. If you kind of just, just um, detach the nerves, basically, it will help the vessels dilate and not clamp down as much, but it is, it's a big procedure and you need a specialist to do that. Um, so in the end for her, one month later, she looks much better already. So what she did was started the pentoxifiline on top of the other medicine she was already on, switched over to that long-standing um, calcium channel blocker, nifedipine, and did the Botox injection. And we increased her, um, the MMF, uh, the mycophenolate mofetil for the anti-inflammatory effect. Um, still having issues with the insurance for the bosentin and the IV prostanoid, but at least we're, we're moving along and getting some results. So that was her before and after picture. So you can see that necrotic ulcer kind of uh, is healing and shed off. And uh, she actually luckily didn't lose too much at the tip of her finger. And then um, three months after our team call, she got another round of Botox, also added the fluoxetine that SSRI was talking about. So she's on like six medications now. We'll eventually pull them back, but we need to get this under control. And it is, she's doing much better. Um, fingers are still a little bit cool, um, but doing well. And I know I'm out of time. So um, the, um, so the plan though for her is to do that IV admission for a couple of days to do that IV epoprostenol. Um, actually next month, um, and then repeat that Im that imaging to see if her vessels are, do actually look better after all this intervention. And then I'm going to see her in the next few months. Um, so take home message is it's a multidisciplinary approach, multi-targeted approach. And we learn from our, our adult rheumatology colleagues, but keep in mind, these are not little adults. You know, some things that might be approved for the adults aren't approved for our kids. So we have to jump through extra barriers and we also have other things to consider. Um, so I just Again, this is an extreme case. It's not gonna to apply to all of you, but just so you know, all the different resources that might be in our back pocket for a patient that has more severe Raynaud's and digital ulcers. Um, and I, I have a recent publication that's an overall summary of just, it's a little more for a general pediatrician or rheumatologist, but it does talk about all these different medicines and how they work together. 
and all the clinical trials that are that fed this data and the treatment choices are there as well. So thank you. That is it. This is the Kids Get Scleroderma 2, first one in 2016 in Hackensack, New Jersey. You may recognize your child in this picture and you might say, oh my gosh, they're so much older now. Um, but thanks for joining again. Um, we are super excited to host this. All right. Well, thanks so much, Winnie. I think if we do five minutes of questions on this and then five on your next session, then we should be getting close to back on time. So you have time for a couple of the questions in the chat. So maybe I'll stop sharing and try to get to find the questions. Okay. All right. Uh, and Dr. Torek, I'll throw one out because I had replied individually to one person and I think they meant to then send a message to the group but accidentally sent it directly to me personally, but it was um, a question about how common severe Raynaud's is in general. Oh, how common severe Raynaud's? Um, you know, so all Raynaud's is high, 90%. I would say severe in my clinical practice of patients, I would say about 20% that have like the ongoing digital ulcers that we need to keep adding different medicines. Um, and there was some a question about nifedipine. Um, so nifedipine, the dose that we use is typically about 30 milligrams. So the goal is not to reduce the blood pressure, but if sometimes patients are more sensitive than others, so it might slightly reduce their blood pressure, but it's usually when you get to the higher doses, like 60 or higher. Um, and the, you know, cause it's in, initially a blood pressure medicine. We kind of like borrowed it from cardiology. Um, so that's why I mentioned it. But typically I'll tell my patients to start the calcium channel blocker at night and typically on a weekend. So in case they get a little lightheaded or just don't feel great, like you, you kind of know that and then they get used to it over a few days um, rather than doing it first thing in the morning, um, they might like feel a little more lightheaded. Um, but typically it will not outright lower the blood pressure, but as you go to the higher doses, it may. I'm looking to see if there's other questions here. Botox is a good... Okay, is Botox a good alternative to cut down on some? Oh yeah, so yes, yeah. so Botox. So if your kiddo ends up having uh, uh, you know more digital ulcers that are hard to control, um, Botox is a nice way to start peeling off if your your child's on like three or four of these medicines I'm talking about. A uh, Botox is a nice way to start peeling off um, some of the everyday oral agents for sure. You probably still need one or two of the other ones, but it might go from four to two if you do the Botox. And um, derm does that, plastic surgery does it, um, but your rheumatologist should know locally who they would, you know, kind of prefer. Do not do Botox in a strip mall. They don't know scleroderma. It will not be a good outcome. You need to go to a medical pediatric, you know, dermatologist or plastic surgeon to do that. All right, other questions. The other one I saw was a question about what to like acutely do in the midst of a Raynaud's episode. Um, and then also a question about using, uh, you know, hand, alcohol hand sanitizer in kids with, um, who are suffering with scleroderma hands. Okay. Yeah. Both good questions. So, um, the first one, sorry, I got, uh, oh, the, what to do acutely in the Raynaud's. So, yeah, so that's why, um, it talk to your rheumatology provider, like let them know if you're having an acute episode for sure. Um, but it is nice, just even if you're at the clinic visit, you're not having an acute episode, just to be like, oh, hey, I heard about this nitro paste. Um, it's really nice to just like pick up that from the pharmacy um, and have that ready to go. It literally is like, you just put out a little pea size, like toothpaste size. And so again, say it's like the middle finger that's getting a lot of the ray knots. You put a tooth a uh, little kind of pea size on the bottom of here and here, that's where the vessels kind of come up and feed that finger. You know, if you're having an ulcer on their middle finger, put it at the base there, and then that will help dilate it. Um, it can, it can give you systemic effects and lower the blood pressure, make you feel a little lightheaded. But honestly, like if you're having, uh, you know, greater than 20, 30 minutes, a really, really, really like white fingertip painful, it's not getting better on rewarming. Um, that's something you can definitely do at home. You should have that nitro paste handy and, but call your rheumatologist as well, just so they know what's going on and send them pictures. Pictures is really, really helpful, um, to, to just show what's going on with, with your child. And then the second, the hand sanitizer, I wish I had a good alternative. That's actually a great question. Um, if any of the families like know a particular alternative, um, that they've been using, um, that's actually where 
unfortunately it's not live, but that's where I learned the most is when I go to these vendor meetings. And um, that's where I learned about the Meta Honey um, at the Scleroderma Foundation Conference. Um, so I'm happy if any of the parents have any particular suggestions for the alternative to hand sanitizer. I'm looking in the chat, I don't see anything just yet. And, okay. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can't answer specific things about your particular um, your particular child. Um, I would have them, you know, if, if they're on um, one agent and if it's low dose and their Raynaud's is relatively controlled, meaning not having um, a lot of Raynaud's attacks, uh, you might have one or two, you know, a day, but if it's under, it's under control, five minutes, it's gone, then I don't feel strongly that your child would need to up the therapy. Um, but it's if the Raynaud's attacks are getting more frequent, getting worse, like, oh, hey, it was just like a little bit of white on the tip of the finger. Now it's getting white all the way down the finger and it's happening, you know, frequently or new digital ulcers, definitely let your rheumatologist know and, and you might be changing therapy. But if the Raynaud's you feel is pretty stable. There's no need to keep bumping the dose of medicines for the vasodilation. 